Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 21, read through 26. Mark chapter 1, 21 through 26. And when they went into Caperna, and straightway on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them one as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And, was, and there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Thou, Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried, with a loud voice he came out of him. Lord God, we just thank you for who you are today. We ask that you uh, come in a very powerful way and minister to us, that you uh, reveal yourself to us, that you show yourself mighty to us. Lord, we humble ourselves before you today. We praise your holy name. And Lord, we thank you that you are who you are for your salvation, for your hope, and that you are the essence of our life and the essence of our hope. And we thank you because we live in precarious days, Lord, and we're watching time and situations wind down to the climax finish of uh, life as we know it. And, Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We praise you, and we just want to honor you, and we say this in your name. Amen. Now, we've been looking at the gospel, according to Mark. And we've been looking at the bad news, which uh, is very challenging, but we've also been looking at the good news of the light, our life of Jesus, in light of the bad news about our sin. And uh, we have realized that it's only through Jesus can that bad news be dealt with. It's only through Jesus that sin can be dealt with. And, of course, we considered the pattern of the gospel, that of repentance, identification, the new life coming forth, or being established in us, the testing that goes on, the decreasing that must happen with our self-life or our, our right to our self-life, uh, our calling being defined in the midst of uh, obeying our commission to preach the gospel, the consecration that needs to take place to make sure that that calling comes forth for the glory and the power of God, and of course, ultimately, obedience. Now, the gospel has been confirmed by the revelation of the unveiling of Jesus and the prophetical uh, for fulfillment of it, scripturally speaking. And we know that prophecy is a sure word, that it's also the test of all things, because we can test these out according to the prophecies found in the Old Testament, and the gospel is no exception. It was prophesied in the Old Testament, and it's simply being unveiled, revealed in the New Testament. And the gospel, of course, comes down to what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross on behalf of us to, con to confront and deal with sin, and we have to come to terms with that. We have to receive that. Now, God always confirms this truth. In other words, he will always confirm his witness. And that's why there's always a witness. There's two witnesses at least because it confirms the matter. So we always know that there's going to be a witness of the witness. And there's going to be a confirmation. And we can see this through the Gospels of, you know, of the various, ones that testified who Jesus Christ was and is. So we were introduced also to the voice that proclaimed the word, Jesus Christ, as he prepared the way for the preaching of the gospel. Now we come to an important matter. And most people don't think about this, but it is important. And it comes down to who introduced Jesus as the Son of God in each gospel. Now, the reason this is important is because God has always introduced himself. He introduced himself to Abraham. He introduced himself to uh, Isaac and Jacob and Moses. He's always introducing himself to the people. He introduces himself initially before a beginning of a great work. And you see that 
So that pattern is consistent in what God's going to do. You can see that before he called Abraham out, he introduced himself. Before uh, he required Isaac to have total faith in uh, what he wanted to accomplish, he introduced himself. Uh, you know, when Jacob was on his way out of the promised land to his uncle, he introduced himself. Uh, before Moses was, uh, you know, called out to lead the people of Israel into uh, the promised land, uh, God introduced himself as the great I am that I am. And so here we have, uh, at the very beginning of a new work, uh, a, a work of redemption, the work of fulfilling all the Old Testament, we have the introduction again. We have God introducing himself to men introducing himself into history. And this is very important because there's this new covenant that's going to come out of it. It's not going to do away with the old. It's going to fulfill the old. But it's a new covenant, an everlasting covenant, a better covenant. And so God will always introduce himself. There is no excuse as to why people would say, oh, well, we don't know there's a God. Look, he's always introduced himself. So who has introduced Jesus Christ, God incarnate, in the midst of history, in the midst of all these activities, in the midst of religion, who has introduced him in these different Gospels? And it's important to understand. So as you look at this, you'll see that in Matthew, it's the Father that actually introduces Jesus as the Son uh, during his baptism. It's the Father. So you have the Father that's introducing the Son, and what you get from that, from that point on is the confirmation that the Father did introduce Jesus as the Son. Now in the, uh, uh, sec in the, in the Gospel of Luke, you have the angels introducing him as the Son of the Highest the night he came into the world. So from that point on, once he comes into ministry, the Father confirms the witness of the angels. That is true. What they said is true. Now, when it comes to John, it was John the Baptist that introduced Jesus as the Son of God after uh, Jesus was confirmed to him by the descending of the Holy Spirit on him. Because John was looking for a certain sign that this is truly Jesus, a sign that confirmed that it was Jesus, and it was the descending of the Holy Spirit because that was the sign he was told to look for. If you don't believe me, look at John chapter 1 with me. John chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 32 through 34. Well, actually, let's look at verse 31. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I am come baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same sent unto me, up on whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him the same is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I saw, bore witness, and this is the Son of God. So there you go. And, of course, John uh, was just uh, waiting for that confirmation that he proclaimed that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God incarnate. He was sent from God. And he is of God. He is God. And so we come down to who or what. Uh, basically bore witness to Jesus' identification in Mark. Now, the amazing thing about Mark, in the chapter 1 alone, there are two, two witnesses that bear testimony or record that Jesus is who he is. And, of course, Mark is a book of proof. So you have both witnesses right there in the same chapter. Uh, one declaring something, the other one identifying or confirming it. So who confirmed who in chapter 1 of Mark? Well, if you look at verse 11, it's going to tell you the first one that introduces Jesus uh, as the Son of God. Verse 11, And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 
So who we have is a father. He says, this is my son. And I'm well pleased with him. So the father is the initial witness or bearing record of who Jesus is. So who's going to come along and confirm that record? Who is going to confirm the witness and the testimony of God? You see, it's amazing. Even God is being confirmed here. Even his record, his testimony is being confirmed because that is the way it's done. It takes two or three witnesses to confirm a matter. So who is the second one? Now, the second one's very important. We already know the Father introduced him. But who's the second one that comes along and confirms it? This is the amazing part. Let's look at the second source or the other source that identifies him. Verses 21 through 24. And they went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. The Holy One of God. Number one, God is the only one that's holy. <coughs> so I, right there, that the unclean spirit is identifying the very nature of Jesus. He's identifying the very nature of Jesus. He's identifying his authority over him. He is identifying the power of who Jesus is. He's identifying. It is a demon, people, an unclean spirit that confirms the identity of Jesus in Mark. And this is very important to understand. Because you know what says? All creation recognized Jesus, who he is, including the demons, except man. Man just won't want to recognize him. They don't want to get it. They don't want to be responsible. They want to go to hell. They don't want any accountability to a holy God. Man's the only one that refuses to recognize his creator. Man is the only one that refuses to accept what God has provided in terms of salvation. It is man in his intellectual, foolish unbelief. That is the only aspect of creation that rejects this. That will not accept the record. The witnesses. Not just one record, but many records. Including the demons themselves. And you have to understand that. Now, why is it important to understand or consider who introduces Jesus? Well, let's look at that. We know the Father introduced him, which means the, thro thro the throne of heaven points to him being who he is. And, of course, in Christ, the, the, the positions of king, priest, and prophet are going to be totally fulfilled in him. But it's the throne of heaven that introduces him. In, in other words, the Father. Now we see that the angels introduce him. The messengers of heaven introduce him. So we also see that in spite of unbelief, man also introduces Jesus in the form of John the Baptist as well as the law of his followers, his disciples. And today, I am bearing record that Jesus is the Son of God. He's God incarnate. I'm bearing that record because it's a revelation in my spirit. It's a revelation because I chose to believe, not walk in my own little intellectual, spiritual lies, little stisic world of perversion, because I don't want to believe that Jesus could be God in the flesh. I believe it. I believe that when I first became a Christian, even though I didn't understand it, I believe it. I don't walk by my understanding. I walk by faith in what the Word of God says, and I don't debate with it. And you debate with it because you don't want to believe it. And you don't want to believe it because somewhere along the line you don't want to be accountable. So you walk in unbelief towards the record and the witness that has been given to you about Jesus Christ. And that is going to cost you your soul. 
And you're going to spend eternity regretting it. But there's absolutely nothing you can do. And that's why the preaching of the gospel, first of all, calls for repentance. Repentance from your unbelief, your perverted, wicked, intellectual adultery. That's what it calls us from. And so here we have man in the form of John the Baptist introducing Jesus. Now we see the kingdom of darkness introducing him. Now let's look at what James 2.19 says about this because it's very important. 2.19 Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. I want you to know the devil's not going to tremble before you. You're nothing. The devil's not going to tremble before all man's doctrines. The devil's not subject to doctrines. The devil's not going to bow its head before the Pope of the Catholic Church. He's not going to tremble at Rick Warren. He's not going to tremble at anybody, but I'm going to tell you something. He's going to tremble at one, and that is God himself. And we see this devil trembling at Jesus, saying, are you here to destroy us? They recognized who he was. They knew what? They knew he was God. They knew he was creator. And guess what? Because he is God and creator, they are in subjection to him. And he has the authority to destroy them. I want you to understand this. Remember, we're talking about the gospel. And Mark is going to show you the power of the gospel. He's going to show you the authority of the gospel. That's because of who Jesus is. It's because of who Jesus is. Now, as we consider this reality, all the realms of creation, heaven, earth, and the kingdom of darkness confirm Jesus' identity. All three realms confirm Jesus' identity. All three realms served as a record gave a record that Jesus is who he is. And you need to believe it. As I said, every, all creation believes it. All creation responds to it except man who has this free will to be total, utterly fools in everything they do. And that's the reality of it. Because they walk in rebellion and unbelief. Now, in light of this, the fact that all these realms gave a record, confirmed the record, verified the record of who Jesus is, we can begin to understand and appreciate Paul's statement in Philippians chapter 2. Turn with me. Philippians chapter 2. Most of us know this famous thing, but consider it in light of this. Consider it in light of the presentation of the gospel in Mark. Verses 9 through 10, actually 11. Where, wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We're seeing that right here. We're seeing it in all four Gospels. That every arena, every realm recognized, acknowledged, recorded that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh that came to save us. Because he's the only one that could. No mere man could do it. Only God could do it. And he did it in the form of man. And it's that simple. There's no debate, there's no discussion, there's no controversy about it except man in his own unbelief, in his own arrogant, foolish arrogance. Intellectual arrogance is what causes this debate. 
And then you always have those who say, oh, I had a false life. I had this life that Jesus has not gone in the flesh. So did the Mormons. So did every other cult. So welcome to the great percentage of cults. Big deal. I'll tell you what is, is unusual. People who really believe and know who Jesus is. That is a real rarity. We have our little groups. Oh, oh, well, I know. You know, I had this light. Yeah, you have a false light. It's called uh, Satan comes as an angel of light. Big deal. So you bought the lie of Satan. Welcome to humanity. Welcome to deceive humanity towards the light of the gospel. Take a number and step in line as you go to hell. Because that's basically what you're going to do. You refuse to believe who Jesus is. And the record has been given over and over by every realm that Jesus is who he is. And there will be no excuse on Judgment Day. There will be no excuse. Because we have the witness of all existing realms confirming his identity. In Mark we have we are showing that he not only has authority in his teaching, but power over the realm of darkness. Authority in his teaching and power over the realm of darkness. We see this uh, right here as we read, that even the crowds were astonished in 22 at this darkness, for he taught them as one that had authority, not as the scribes. The scribes did not have authority. So what gives people authority, people? I'm going to tell you this one thing, and one thing only that gives you authority. And this one thing is you better believe it. But it's not a matter of just believe it. You have to walk it out. You have to obey it. You have to apply it. It has to become your reality. The one thing that gives you authority is truth. Now, I've had people tell me, Rayle, you teach with authority. And I think the only reason I teach with authority is because I'm teaching the truth. And not only am I teaching it, I believe it. And not only do I believe it, I obey it. I apply it. I do everything I can to make it a reality in my life because I love it. If you don't love the truth, you will not have authority. If you do not walk in the truth, you will not have authority. If you do not apply the truth, you will not have authority. Jesus was truth. He was truth. He was the beginning and end of all truth. And he had authority because of that truth. Today we hear people who have charisma, who people who walk around with a false light and false anointing saying, oh, look at my, look at what I have. But they have absolutely no authority because that truth is missing. The truth is missing. It's that simple. We see he has authority in his teaching. Now we see the power over the realm of darkness. Do you not see the power of the gospel? Don't you see the power of the gospel? What that power is, it's Jesus himself. Even the devils had to submit to Jesus The witness and the record that we have stipulates what the authority and the power of the gospel is. It's Jesus as the truth. It's Jesus as God in the flesh. His truth gives him authority. He walks in authority. As man, he was given authority. But he is the essence of authority because of truth. And that's the reality, and he had the power, the power of the gospel, because of who he is. Now let's look at the reaction of the un to the unclean spirit, which serves as a witness to the onlookers that this is truly a man of power, of authority, of position. Let's look at that in 27 through 28. And they were all amazed, and so much that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? 
What new doctrine is this? But with authority command to see even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame is spread abroad throughout all the regions around about Galilee. I want you to know something. These demons recognized Jesus' authority. And they knew how that authority had power to destroy them. Now you've got to understand this. They recognized his authority. They recognized who he was. God is authority. He's authority over us. We are to be in subjection to his authority. What he lays out, what he expounds on, what he requires from us. This is, this is what he tells us to do in the word of God. He tells us because he has authority. And the reason with that authority comes the power to carry it out. I have authority because I stand on the truth. And what you can bank on is whatever the truth says is true. And that down the line you will either reap it or you're going to, uh, you're going to reap the rewards or the consequences of it. That's how it works. So we see this gospel is confirmed by Jesus' authority and his teaching, his power over the kingdom of the darkness. And now here comes the third part of what brings some confirmation, and that is signs and wonders. Let's look at that, 29 to 31. And forthwith, when they, they were come out of the synagogue, they entered in the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and straightway they tell him of her. And he came, took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. This is a sign. Now, people, I know there is so much abuse with signs and wonders. And there are so much fear, and there's so much speculation surrounding signs and wonders. People just want to run the other way when you talk about signs and wonders. The reason for this is because people are ignorant for the, they're ignorant as to why there were signs and wonders. They are totally ignorant about it. And they will not discern. They will not discern. Now, do I believe today that there's a lot of signs and wonders going on in the world? Yes, I do. But I believe it is where the gospel is being preached to hungry, thirsty souls. I believe there are signs and wonders happening in America, but it's very small because we walk in our intellectual unbelief and we walk according to the wrong spirit because we are people who want entertainment. We don't want the truth. And so when people chase after signs and wonders, it's because they want to be entertained. They want to be filled a certain way. It has nothing to do with truth. Truth is missing from signs and wonders today. In fact, a couple years ago, uh, one of the big time leaders at that time he's dead and I don't know if he's in heaven or hell today I hope he repented because he was wrong and he has he's led a lot of people astray because he's wrong he's wrong anyway he had this big movement called unity and signs and wonders I don't know if you know what I'm talking about but it started some terrible movement and some of them are still going on. They're wicked. They're false. And people need to flee from them. And the problem is they have come into the midst of the church and it's caused tremendous division between the sheep and the goats. And people are running here and they're running there because of, these, because of this environment of signs and wonders. And, there, and, the, and the sad reality of it is people is in the end days, many people are going to be deceived by what? Signs and wonders. So we need to understand them. And we need to understand what they're for and why they were given. And people, I'm going to tell you right now why signs and wonders were given. They were co given to confirm. Not to entertain, but to confirm. 
They were initially given to confirm the Messiah. So you have the next record that this is the Messiah because what was prophesied about the Messiah is that he would bring healing. He was not only going to be the light, but he would bring healing. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But now that the Messiah has been confirmed, please hear me. Now that the Messiah has been confirmed, the only things, the only thing that signs and wonders confirm, there's a couple of things they confirm now. They confirm the message of the gospel, not the messenger. Hear me. Just because there's signs and wonders does not mean that is the messenger of God. What you have to say, okay, is what is the message? Does the message lead me to Jesus? Does it lead me to repentance, to love him more? What does it, where does it lead me? If it doesn't lead it to Jesus, it is a false message. That's why we discern everything in spirit and truth. Okay, so there's a spiritual thing going on, but does it lead me to truth? It's false. Signs and wonders follow to confirm the message of the gospel, not the messenger. The second thing that it confirms is people's faith in the messenger in the Lord Jesus Christ. It confirms people's faith. Please hear me. And the reason it confirms my faith is because I have chose to believe and to walk, and then I have this confirmation of signs and wonders. That says you are true in believing. I'm confirming your faith in the gospel. I'm confirming your faith in Christ. Signs and wonders, healings. I'm confirming your faith. I'm confirming my message. It is not to confirm the messenger. The messenger has already been confirmed. It's Jesus. Now the message about Jesus is being confirmed through signs and wonders. Please hear me. Get it right. Test them out. Don't run from them. Test them out. Because people need to be instructed. People need to know what's of God and what isn't of God. And there is such a mixture, and most of it is not of God. But if it's of God, you need to be receptive of it. And you need to receive it by faith. And let it confirm your life in God. Confirm your faith in God. Now, do you believe me? Well, let's look at what Mark 16 says, because he pretty well lays it out. Remember, signs and wonders are a record, are a witness, they confirm. And so Mark lays that out in Mark 16. Let's look at that. 16. So, uh, uh, we're going to look at 17 and 18. Well, actually 16. Well, let's look. let's look at 15 through 18. We might as well. He said unto them, Go you all in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now remember, we're talking about the power of the gospel. He that believes, notice, he that believes and is, and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believes not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow those who, who believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This will fall those who believe. It confirms their faith. It confirms the message of the gospel. Please understand that. It does not confirm the messenger. The messenger's spirit has to be tested. Uh, the direction or the truth of the message has to come out and uh, rest with the truth of Jesus Christ. If it doesn't, it's all false. And do not follow it. Do not believe it, because in the end days, that's how people are going to be deceived, with lying signs and wonders. Now, it's important to understand what way the gospel is confirmed. 
Now, the authority in Jesus' teaching confirmed that he was speaking the truth. And the truth comes from God. Now, we believe because there is authority in what is being said. And authority because it is backed up by the word and by signs and wonders. Now, power over the kingdom of darkness confirms Jesus' identity as the Son of God. All realms are in subjection to him. So, first of all, the fact of what he was preaching had to be confirmed as truth. They had to see the authority in what he was preaching, and then it would then that authority would be backed up by power over the demonic realm. And we know that Jesus had power over all the realms. He calmed the storms. The, the demons had to bow to him. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on here that confirms who he is. Now, it all brings us back to the fact that all realms are in subjection to him because he is our creator. So finally, we have these signs and wonders that simply confirm people's faith. Yes, it confirmed the messenger. It confirmed the message, but it also confirmed the faith of those who say, I choose to believe and follow him. I choose to believe and receive from him. It's important to understand that. So even believers fail to understand what confirms what. And many think that signs and wonders confirm the messenger. They don't realize that confirms the message or their faith in that message or in God. It confirms that. Now many associate power to signs and wonders. That's not true. The real test of power, people, isn't in signs and wonders because uh, you can receive power from the kingdom of darkness. So that's not the real test. The real test of power comes along the line of how the kingdom of darkness responds to you. That's the test. Because if you don't have the power, if you don't have the authority, you do not have power over the kingdom of darkness. And when the kingdom of darkness responds to you, it's not because you have all power. You have all authority behind you, which says you've got the power to carry it out in that authority. The demons recognize Jesus' authority. They recognize that he had power over them. Authority gave him power over them. So the power is not a sign of wonders. People walk around, oh, I'm powerful. Look at this. That's not power, people. That can be fake. What's power is how darkness, the kingdom of darkness, responds to you. That's the key. If you do not have authority because of what you believe about Jesus, you will not have power in regards to the kingdom of darkness. Hear me? Now, why is this important? Well, a couple of years ago, I had a bunch of people from a particular Christian denomination come to me for a ministry. And the one thing that I recognized about them is that they had no authority. They had no authority over the power of darkness. And this was a consistent thing that came out of them. I thought, well, where's your power? Where's your authority? You know, they talked about power, they talked about everything, it sounded right, but there was absolutely no authority. No authority at all in anything. There was chaos, there was all kinds of things going on in their lives, and of course we all have that, but someone was very demonic and there was no authority over it. There was no discernment, there was no separation. And so I was, I was stunned by this because I've, you know, I've met people that, yeah, they were in oppression, but once they were set free, you know, they had this authority, they had this uh, uh, authority overcome the kingdom of darkness. So one day it finally uh, came out. They really do not, they, they, these people didn't believe Jesus was God in the flesh. And the light went on. I thought that's why they have no authority. Because the Jesus they believe in has no authority. The Jesus they believe in doesn't even exist. No wonder 
why they have no authority. Therefore, they have no power. And if they come up against the kingdom of darkness, sometimes, you know, God has mercy on people and tells, uh, you know, certain demons to go. But a lot of times when you don't have any authority, the demons just play with you. They just toy with you. Because they don't recognize the Jesus you have as having any power or any say over them because the Jesus you have is not creator. He's not God in the flesh. I want you to understand how important this issue is. You have absolutely no authority unless you believe the record and the witness given by the word of God concerning who Jesus Christ is. I cannot stress that enough. I can't stress that you believe it enough, and I can't stress you teach it enough. That you instill it in your children. You can't fake such power and authority, because without the authority, you have no power over darkness. You either have it or you don't. You, you can play it, you can talk it, but Satan isn't going to respond to you. The kingdom of darkness can fake signs and wonders, and sadly many people believe this confirms the messenger rather than the message or the people's faith in the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Now comes the fruit of true ministry, it, it, and most people think the fruit of true ministry is power, right? No, it's not power. You're going to be surprised what true fruit of ministry is. It's healing. Now I'm not talking about physical healing. Even though physical healing can come out of it, it's one of the signs and wonders. I'm not talking about physical healing. I'm talking about spiritual healing. I'm talking about uh, emotional healing. Because I want you to understand, people, what healing is. Healing means you've been restored. Healing is a restoration. And in the kingdom of God, what needs to be restored is man's relationship with God. So the real purpose of healing in the kingdom of God is reconciliation. Now there's a physical sign, healing that, was, that served as a sign. But the whole purpose of healing is restoration. Not just physical restoration, but spiritual restoration. And a lot of people, do, they don't understand that. Now Jesus came to heal people. Because that was the real fruit of true ministry, that it results in healing. Now, how many of you understand what I'm saying? Some of you have come to me, and uh, you, have, you have shared your problems with me, and we have prayed about it, and the Lord has stepped on the scene, and he has what? He's touched you. And what came out of that was healing. And what came out of that healing was what? Restoration. Restoration in your relationships with people, especially your relationship with God. There's always that restoration because the ministry of the gospel is about healing. It's about the fruit of healing. And it's not just physical healing, but spiritual healing. That's especially what it's about. Because remember, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He's talking about reconciliation, restoration of man's relationship with God. It's about healing. And I would tell you, every true ministry of the gospel is about healing. Because to be healed, you have to be delivered or saved. That's the reality of healing. And, and Jesus came to do that. Let's look at that in Luke 18. Luke 18. Oh, I'm mean, sorry. Luke 4. I got that wrong. Luke 4 is 18 and 19. It's one of my favorite uh, verses, 18 and 19. Because it's all about... The, the whole bottom line of ministry. And here it is. The Spirit of the Lord is up on me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart, preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And this is what Jesus was anointed to do, to bring healing. 
So, excuse me, let's look at this healing. He says, first of all, the Spirit of the Lord is up on me because he has anointed me to preach. And so the first thing we have is preaching. Why? Why do we have to have preaching? It's a good question, huh? Well, preaching prepares the way. For what? For healing. It prepares the way for people to receive the healing. Because you have to receive the healing. You have to receive the deliverance. You have to receive the touch. You have to receive whatever from the Lord to be restored in that area. To be healed in that area. You don't believe me? Some of you are still being healed. Some of you may have not even begun to be healed. I don't know. Now, some of you need to be healed today. But you're going to have to receive that healing. And it begins with the preaching, which is the preparation to cause you to turn in repentance to receive that healing. Now, it goes on to say, to preach the gospel to the poor. Those are those who are what? Poor in spirit. They know they have a need. They know they need to be restored. They know they need reconciliation. They know these things. They're humble enough to know it. So he's preparing the way with the gospel for those who are poor in spirit to what? To heal the brokenhearted. You can't receive if you have a broken heart. You don't trust if you have a broken heart. You can't forgive if you have a broken heart. You will walk around wounded if you have a broken heart. And then he goes on to say what? To preach deliverance to the captives. How many of you are so oppressed, so overwhelmed, so in despair that you need to be restored with hope? The gospel brings hope. The preaching brings hope. Truth brings hope. And you can be delivered. And you can be restored to that which is, is, is free, that which constitutes liberty to become all you are intended to be. So let's go on. And it says, recovering the sight to the blind. How many of you are blinded by the heart and the mind and the intention that God has towards you? Because you're a rebellion, you're angry, you're upset because you're not God. And he wants to bring the light. He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to bring hope. He wants to restore you again. And so it comes down to the set liberty the man has been bruised. He's talking about the fact that everybody's been bruised by sin. And he has come to heal that bruising, that wounding, to set you at liberty. To know what it means to receive the fullness of God in your life and to have that restoration in your relationship with God. It's all about healing people. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I looked that up. It means the year of redemption. You know, every seven years and every 50 years, they had a year of redemption. Where everything was redeemed back or could be redeemed back. That the, that the Jewish uh, servant was set free. And that he could be bought back. It was all about redemption. It was all about liberty. It was all about being free. And so he says, I've come to preach the acceptable year of redemption. That you all can be redeemed. That you can know the healing and the restoration that you can have with God. That's what he was saying. So the the gospel prepares us to receive the healing. And believing puts us in a state of receiving. Every one of us needs to be healed from sin. The effects, the influences, the activities of sin in our life. And healing begins with the truth. And truth makes us free to receive. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the power of the gospel, people. It's healing. It's healing. So what do we need to do to receive healing? We have to seek out Jesus. That's what we have to do. We have to seek out Jesus. I don't know about you, but I know the gospel has healed me. As I have become more and more receptive 
who Jesus is, what he wants to accomplish in my life, the more I've been healed. I haven't been healed because I know about the word. I have been healed because I know the word. I know Jesus. That's my testimony. My testimony isn't about where I came from. My testimony is about what God has done in me. He has brought healing in my life through Jesus Christ. He wants to bring healing in your life. He wants to bring healing in your life today. And maybe that healing is you don't know Jesus. You never really received him. Oh, you intellectually bought it, but you didn't buy it in the heart. You didn't receive it in the heart. So you've never been healed. You've never been healed from uh, the dictates of sin in your life, from the influence of sin on your life. You've never been healed from it. You're still walking wounded because your heart hasn't been healed. You haven't been set free from certain aspects of your life. And you're still walking around. You haven't been restored. If you're that way today, then you need to humble yourself today. You need to seek the face of Jesus and you need to say, I want to know you for who you are. I want to have your authority. I want to know what it means to walk in your power. I want to know what it means to overcome and be healed. And people, we need to be healed to be overcomers. And many people are not overcomers because they've never been healed. And you know, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of healing, of restoration, of being reconciled back to God in a living relationship. And so will you bow your heads with me? Lord God, this is a simple message, but it's a message of the cross. It's the power of the cross, that the real fruit of all true ministry is healing, not physical healing, even though that can be a sign, but spiritual healing, what is truly the restoration of man back into a relationship with God where his spirit, his soul, can be once again restored to the fullness of having communion with you. Lord, we are missing it. We're missing it because we don't understand. We're missing it because we're putting the wrong emphasis in the wrong areas. We're missing it because we have gone along with our own theology and we have come under a wrong spirit because we want power without authority. We don't want to pay the price of authority. That means to know you, to truly believe you, to walk in your truth, to obey your word. And so, Lord, I pray today that you have mercy upon your wretched people, the church, that you will have mercy upon your sheep that are being scattered because they can't hear your call in the voice of their pastor or in the voice of their leaders. They can't hear your voice. And, Lord, today I pray you'll have mercy upon your church. You'll have mercy upon the people that are here today, that you'll have mercy because we have not really come into the fullness of the power of the gospel, which is healing, restoration, back in a relationship with you. God, have mercy because we're missing it. We're making it too much religion and not enough relationship. And, Lord, we need a relationship with you. We need to be restored because of what our sin has done, because of what our perversion has done, because we have been rebellious and angry and disobedient towards you. And, Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, for we're wretched in our state. And, Lord, bring us, bring us to your altar, the cross. And, Lord, bring us in repentance, Bring us to be identified. Bring us, Lord, so we can totally have your life established in us. Bring us, Lord, so we can withstand the temptations and decrease in our life and, and our value system and everything that's not, uh, not lined up to you decrease so that we can have our calling in this com great commission of the gospel be truly defined so we can be consecrated and, Lord, so we can truly obey in spirit and truth. Lord, we just thank you for your love and grace and your mercy that you have shown us. And, Lord, as we enter this time of meditation and pondering, I pray your spirit will break through all the nonsense and the foolishness of our hearts and our theologies and our doctrines and that we will come in humility to the altar and receive what you have for us. And we say this in your name. Amen.